NG Poland and JS Poland conferences are coming soon. This year promises to be exceptional. We will see the Angular team on the stage. We will see quick creator, solid JS creator, experts from Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Cisco, Old Zero, and many, many more. Join an amazing group of developers like you today. Let's come together to celebrate Angular and JavaScript. Go to ngpoland.pl and sign up now. What's up, everyone? This is Dariusz Kalbarczyk, co-founder of MG Poland, JS Poland, AngularMaster.dev and WorkshopFest.dev. Welcome back to Angular Master Podcast. Today, we've got a special guest from Poland, excellent speaker, writer, tech lead at Vizlip and Astrato. Ladies and gentlemen, David Kędzierski. Hi, David. How are you? Hi, Derek. I'm fine. Thank you very much. I'm very excited. Thank you. For those who don't know you yet, please tell us about yourself and about your company. I'm a tech lead at Vizdip and Astrata. I manage cross-discipline team of around 10 engineers on a daily basis. My team, on the other hand, handles like dozens of thousands of end users every single day. Quite challenging, if I'm honest. I'm also aspiring principal developer and book writer. Personally, I like Diablo and Horizon, Brutalism and Abstractionism, and of course, Angular and NestJS, right? In this deep, we produce extensions to ClickSense and ClickCloud environments. Uh, so Click is just BI tool and a BI tool is some sort of different Excel, let's say. So you get the data, read the data, display data, and you know stuff like that. Uh, we have almost five, five or six products. I don't remember if I'm honest. Some of them are pure visualizations like bar chart, line chart. Etc. Scatter chart uh, with hundreds of settings. It's very highly configurable. We also extend some click capabilities. So we have, for example, a write back product, uh, thanks to which we can update data super easily without almost no effort. What wasn't possible before? Uh, we have also our very own some sort of messenger which allows end users to communicate with each other within the click context, right? Um, We encounter many interesting challenges, so uh, without going into too many details, imagine that sometimes we need to display 30 Angular applications within the same browser window, and it, of course, must have, you know, good performance and stuff like that. Yeah, and on the other hand, uh, in Astrato, uh, we aren't just extending capabilities of existing products on the market. We create our own BI tools on top of Snowflake, Dreamio, BigQuery, all the interesting hot databases, right? Uh, It is a cloud-based application with, you know, many interesting challenges as well. Yeah, so that's me and that's this different Astrato. Why sometimes things don't work very well? In 1968, uh, there was a NATO conference uh, where a term software crisis has been created. And f- I can just quote a you know, simple phrase by David and Fraser. There is a widening gap between ambitions and achievements in software engineering. This gap appears in several dimensions between promises to users and performance achieved by software, between what seems to be ultimately possible and what is achievable now, and between estimates of software costs and expenditures. Um, And I must admit, you know, when I first read that sentence, it appeared to me like, oh my God, 50 years later, right? And we still encounter similar issues, almost the same problems, right? Uh, So that was 
you know, my reasoning why did I started digging into that topic. Um, and soon enough, you know, I encounter more examples, let's say. So I must, you know, refer to Dijkstra, uh, the author of Wonderful, The Humble Programmer from 1972. Um, let me just, I, I, I don't remember exact quote, but let me just paraphrase. So Dijkstra said at the beginning, there were like no machines, no computers. So there was no prog- programming as well. Later, machines were weak, couldn't do a lot, and so programming wasn't so difficult and complex, let's say. And later, machines became powerful as hell, (laughs) and so programming became equally powerful, but, you know, we all know with great power comes great responsibility, so programming became hard and complex, right? Or another example, Fred Brooks from the Mythical Man of Mouth from 1975, adding manpower to a late software project makes it later, <laughs> right? Um, and it appeared to me that, yay, you know, almost 50 years later, we still have thousands of managers around the world believing that adding manpower to a late software project will actually help and make it sooner, right? For those who maybe still doesn't believe that's a serious problem, let's say, uh, I can refer to Chaos Report uh, made by the Standish Group in 2015. So based on that research, we know that 19% of all the projects around the world fail fatally. And more than a half of them experience serious obstacles before succeeding. 44% of projects are considered as non-satisfactory. And only 59% of projects are considered as valuable, right? Uh, (laughs) Enough numbers. So, you know, that's the clear proof, at least for me, that my perception of the problem is right. Uh, Then... Well known for everyone, Murphy's uh, and his laws, let's say. If anything can go wrong, it will. (laughs) Nothing is as easy as it looks. Left to themselves, things will get worse. And last but not least, everything takes longer than you think, right? That's the foundation, let's say, for the later work of uh, goal in systematics. But we will go to that uh, Parkinson's laws as well, right? Uh, he, he figured out almost seven laws. The most important one, at least in my opinion, is all work takes as much time as is available. And that affects, you know, almost everything, especially in the IT industry or not, I don't know. Uh, so originally it was about bureaucracy, uh, but these days it's, more or less applicable to all forms of work. And it's mostly about procrastination, if I'm honest. Uh, The more time we have at the start, the more we tend to leave the important work to the very last minute, uh, because just other things are more interesting. It usually leads to overall delays, so the time to do something needs to be expanded. Uh, For example, when you have a long sprint, Uh, let's say four weeks long, you will very soon realize that almost all the work is coming at the end of the sprint. Because usually people think like, oh, I have time, I can do that later. Okay, uh, let's go to the Peter principle, my favorite one, if I'm honest. That includes five sub-principles. For me, the most important ones are Peter's inversion, and hierarchical regression or the failure of success. I know it sounds fancy, but it's very simple. It observes that employees climb or rise up through an organization hierarchy, through promotion, of course, until they reach a level of incompetence, which doesn't allow them to continue to rise up, right? Uh, every position in a given hierarchy will eventually be filled by employees who are incompetent. As simple as that. Uh, There's a couple of mitigation methods for such behavior. 
like you know we can of course provide adequate skill training for employees receiving a promotion right uh but i see it almost everywhere right um and that's also a foundation for systematics so you know about systematics maybe uh first of all let's let's clarify what a system is Right. So for Melvin Sykes, I'm quoting anything divisible into two or more parts which function together is a system with respect to its parts. And for John Gao, uh, the author of book called Systematics, which I'm going to refer to in a minute, is that everything is a system and everything is part of a larger system. So, for example, a team is a system, right? A marriage is a system. A government is a system. A whole universe is a system. And also, of course, a web application or information technology systems are systems. Uh, So systems can be animate or inanimate. And what a systematics is, uh, it is an important branch of systems theory and it is concerned with why and how systems fail. So in order to answer the original question, why don't things work very well, it's pretty much, you know, valuable and very, very helpful. So let's talk about Gold's book. There are more than 30 principles and theories, uh, and we for sure don't have time to go through all of them. So I will choose, you know, the most important ones, in my opinion. And for me, the most important one is really the fundamental theorem, which states new systems mean new problems. And let me explain, elaborate on that. Um, Before, there was only the problem. Now, there's a whole set of new problems associated with the presence and existence of the new system, right? So, for example, you need to update third-party apps on a regular basis. Uh, You need to care about privacy, security, usability, accessibility, performance, and so on and so forth, right? The time and effort is being consumed in the care and feeding of the system itself. And that's really pure reference to the Peter Principle. Um, In really large and complex systems, the original problem may even persist unchanged. And I have a great story, real story from Fizdip. Uh, One of our products was completely inefficient, if I'm honest. We really had to improve the performance. So what we did... We have rewritten it from scratch. (laughs) Guess what? We ended up with two products. Performance of both was pretty the same. I mean, really poor. (laughs) But at the same time, we encountered uh, several new problems, like backward compatibility. Um, This is why almost a year ago, during the JS Poland, uh, when I was presenting... uh, what was the title? Uh, Make Legacy Code Your Friend, something like that. My very first slide was Do Not Rewrite Projects from Scratch. You're listening, Angular Master Podcast. Listen, code, repeat. Everything you need to know to become an Angular Super Developer. Case, it was like that, right? Of course, I'm talking right now about, you know, complex and large. Uh, systems, right? For, I don't know, simple systems, it may really work, right? Or may not, it depends. Okay, so uh, for me, the theorem, the fundamental theorem, new systems mean new problems, is really well reflected in the manifesto for agile software development, right? Just to remind Uh, Everyone's simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done, is essential, right? Almost anything is easier to get into than out of. That's also a quote from the Systematics book. Uh, We must remember about that in order to mitigate it, right? And on the low level of software engineering, if if you think about that, there's, for example, 
uh, dry rule. Don't repeat yourself, right? And it says that we should reduce repetition in the source code and replace it with abstraction. But, you know, everything is trade-off. That's the basic rule of software architecture, right? And uh, there's, in the opposite, in the opposition, let's say, to the dry is rule of three, which stands that it states that two instances of similar code do not require refactoring, but when similar code is used three times, it should be extracted into a new processor, right? So, no, we encounter some kind of dilemma, and as engineers on a daily basis, we need to handle such dilemmas, right? Okay, what else did Gal write in the book? Uh, for example, that's, that's actually very, very funny. Uh, I'm quoting, systems are like babies. Once you get one, you have it. They don't go away. And later, uh, systems not only persist, they grow. And systems not only grow, they also encroach, right? And what does it mean? Uh, imagine that... I would just give you an example. Imagine that you have bought furniture in at IKEA. Uh, you come home and now you have to assemble it. You think you saved money and maybe even time because you have it right now in your living room, for example. But the truth is that it was IKEA's job to do it. <laughs> they just provided you with tools and materials and that's it. It's up to you now to finish the job. They delegated the job that they were supposed to do. Um, That's typical, you know, system encroachment. Uh, Even better example, uh, a few days ago, I was watching TV when a new ad appeared to me. Uh, For the international audience, you must know that in Poland, we have more or less serious problem with dentists. We don't have enough of them, so people often have to wait two, three weeks, maybe even longer for the visit. And now, instead of resolving the real issue, um, the ad says, oh, you just need to take that painkiller pill, so then you can wait for the dentist as long as you need. And I was like, seriously? <laughs> The system is supposed to give me an easy access to the dentist. It's 2022, right? But instead, the system encroached. So now it is up to me if I take the pill or not, but I'm going to wait anyway. That's the overall narration. Why things work strangely, even in paradoxical ways? Very good question. So according to Go, right? Uh, there's a the generalized uncertainty principle, which stands that complex systems exhibit unexpected behaviors. And that's just because reality is more complex than it seems. Uh, there's even the Harvard Law of Animal Behavior. Very, very funny. Uh, let me just quote. Under precisely controlled experimental conditions, a test animal will behave as a damn well pleases, no matter how hard you try. Uh, And it's not just animal behavior, but the behavior of complex systems generally, whether animate or inanimate, is unpredictable, more or less. Um, The fundamental failure theory stands that a system can fail in an infinity number of ways. Um, And any large system is going to be operating most of the time in failure mode. Um, it has pretty interesting implications, if I'm honest. Um, for example, what is crash-only software? Uh, those are programs that handle failures by simply restarting without attempting any sophisticated recovery. So the crucial variable in that case is time needed for the restart or for the upgrade, stuff like that. Um, for example, in Erlang, If a module crashes or needs to be updated, it can be restarted or or replaced without affecting any other part of the program. That's possible due to um, modular structure of the programs and the mechanism known as hot swapping. Um, And another example from Vizdip this time. Uh, In one of our projects, we had diagnosed 
that one functionality accounted for 20% of the overall number of bugs. <laughs> Quite a lot, right? Um, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot was done to improve it. Uh, many developers had to admit defeat, if I'm honest. It was just unmaintainable, but we couldn't give up, right? So what we did instead was crash on the software implementation. We have started reloading part of the app whenever the bug occurred. Uh, at the beginning, it was really slow, but in the end, we have reduced the time needed for the refresh from 500 milliseconds to only 30 milliseconds. That was fast enough. It was acceptable in our case. Since then, we almost never encounter any issue with the mentioned functionality. <laughs> How cool is that, right? Um, for some people, you know, I'm just connecting the dots, right, the dots right now. So it seems to be very similar to the Stalin strategy. Yes, that's Stalin. <laughs> so I know it may be slightly controversial, but when it goes about people management, Stalin sometimes can be a very good inspiration, if I'm honest. When Stalin was facing an individual dangerous for him, he was almost always avoiding active direct confrontation. Instead, he was changing everything around that individual, the context, the frame. So in the end, the individual was forced to adapt the way Stalin preferred. Um, you could be surprised how often in my professional career I refer to that strategy. As a matter of fact, it's, it is even recommended when, for example, someone is sabotaging an organization transformation. Um, if you can't change the system, change the frame, it comes down to the same thing. And this is what we really did in our case, right? Um, so how can we mitigate that unexpected behavior. We have crash only software. We have, for example, chaos engineering. I will just read, you know, a, a sentence from the principles of chaos engineering. Uh, even when all of the individual services in a distributed system are functioning properly, the interactions between those services can cause unpredictable outcomes. Unpredictable Outcomes compounded by rare but disruptive real-world events that affect production environment make these distributed systems inherently chaotic. And you must admit it, you know, sounds similar to the um, to the goal uh, theories, right? So the chaos engineering is really an approach to software testing and quality assurance. You experiment, you break a system on purpose to gather important information useful to improve the system's resiliency, right? Um, what else? We can refer to Manifesto for Agile Software Development. Continuous attention to technical excellence at good design enhances agility. Right, So the continuous attention to technical excellence allows us to react to problems much faster. But the time to market is a crucial measure in the world where systems can fail in an infinite number of ways and where you know, most systems um, operate most of the time in failure mode. We must be able to provide necessary changes, necessary fixes as soon as possible. Where does the topic for this, for our discussion come from? I was sitting and smoking on my balcony, if I'm honest. It was mid-December 2021, perhaps, when I suddenly realized that the more I work in the IT industry, the more I see that projects in overall don't work very well. And even more, the more I live, the more I'm getting older, the more I see that things in general don't work very well or work in paradoxical ways. So I just started my research, right? I just started digging into that topic and 
you know, soon enough it appeared there's a whole uh, branch uh, of the computer science or just science uh, describing almost all of my issues, right? Um, so, yeah, that's the background story, as simple as that. Uh, in software development, perfect is a verb, not an adjective. There's no perfect process. There's no perfect design. There's no perfect stories. You can, however, perfect your process, your design, and your stories. Uh, yes, that's that's completely true. Uh, we are we aren't perfect, and projects aren't perfect. They encounter, you know, many obstacles, right? <laughs> but the major problems of our work aren't so much technological, uh, at least in my opinion, as, let's say, sociological in nature, right? So, you know, talking with various stakeholders, I repeatedly say from the technical point of view, almost anything is possible. The problem often touches different aspects, and one of them is, uh, for example, management quality within a team, a project, or a company. That's a pure reference to the Peter Principle and competence versus incompetence. A great example has been described in uh, extreme ownership, right? How you as Navy say seals, lead, and win. Um, I would just paraphrase. I, I don't remember exact quote. We're having a race. Uh, okay. There were two teams, one the best and one, the other one the worst. Uh, they were having a race in pontoons um, in the same conditions, like it was cold, wet, with extreme physical exhaustions. Um, it was enough to switch the leaders of the teams in order to make the worst one the best, and the best one the worst. Um, and that's a true story. The same team with the same budget, with the same goals and project scopes, uh, with the same time, uh, will provide completely different results depending on the quality of management. And you know how often is the quality of management taken into account when making technical decisions, right? Not so often, I suspect. How will the web look like in five years from now? I can say what's my wish, if that works for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so my wish is that we will see new frameworks leveraging uh, WebAssembly. So there will be more web apps written in Rust, for example. I absolutely don't hate JavaScript, right? But... I must admit it's quite interesting idea of having, you know, statically typed languages on front end. I cheer for all that kind of initiatives. What would you like our listeners to remember from this conversation? Okay, I have two maybe, yeah, maybe three let's call them bullet points. So first of all, I would really like to recommend, recommend you all Systematics uh, book created by John Gold. It, it, you can easily find it in the internet. Um, second of all, and I know how it's going to sound. Uh, I feel like everyone in the IT industry is slightly tired of listening over and over again, you know, agility, 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 um, especially when poorly implemented within an organization. But no, you don't need thousands of books, certificates, and all of that crap. Just study the basics, the principles. Everything you need is there. You can just Google it. You can print it and hang it somewhere near your desk. Just study it every single day and things, I hope, will improve. And the third one, read computer science studies. Uh, we need to get rid of that 
artificial division between engineers and computer scientists. There are thousands of important and valuable researches which can improve our life as engineers. All we need to do is just start reading them. For example, um, there was very interesting research made, made by uh, Microsoft and IBM about uh, TDD. It clearly proves the value behind the TDD in the new projects. But no research proves that TDD works for legacy projects. Right? If you think about it, it makes sense. TDD guide your design, and that's the real value behind it, right? In the grassy projects, the design is already in place. Or another research. People often argue about the value of unit tests, especially on, on the front end. Meanwhile, it's been proven that for the distributed systems, a majority of the production failures, 77%, can be reproduced by a unit test. How cool is that, right? It can be deterministic most of the time. Um, so, you know, read computer science studies, implement them on the engineering level, and I hope feel things will improve. What are you going to talk about during the NG Poland speech? So in the spirit of uh, reducing complexity and striving for simplicity, uh, I'm going to challenge a little bit um, the idea behind module federation, especially in Angular, and look at import map instead. I feel like import map covers most of the use cases. And since it's built in um, the browsers, we can just start using it without third party. David, thank you for today's interesting conversation. I'm looking forward to your performance on NG Poland stage. Thank you very much for the invite. I hope it was a little bit interesting at least. Um, and yeah, see you there. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Finally, please subscribe to our podcast, leave a like and a comment to help us continue to grow.